Hmm. Well, greetings, everybody. My name is James. I'm from the internet. Today, we are going to be talking about encroaching fascism. Now, I am usually the last person who wants to break out the word fascism. Why? Because people overuse and abuse the word to the point where it no longer has any meaning. So I assure you, if I am going to break it out and I am going to use the term encroaching fascism, well, you damn well better be sure I'm about to drop some knowledge on you. And that knowledge specifically pertains to encroaching fascism. This batch of stories coming to us from Kentucky. But first, we're going to review this word usage to make sure everybody is on the same page. Then I'm going to tell you what's going on. And then when I'm finished, y'all can come back and tell me if it is indeed encroaching fascism. Here we go. First half of the term encroaching to enter by gradual steps or by stealth into the possessions or rights of of another. It doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't just pop up. It slowly encroaches upon you. Are we good here? This one is specifically directed to all the people who go, gee, I don't understand how uh, they were just walking around in like Italy and Germany in like 1930 and then, whoops, fascism happened. That's, that's really weird. It slowly encroaches upon you. We good? Okay, let's get to the second part. Fascism, a political philosophy, movement, or regime that exalts nation and often race above the individual and that stands for a centralized, autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader, severe economic and social regimentation, and forcible suppression of opposition. For those of you who are not aware, that last part, forcible suppression of opposition that refers specifically to the police state and their sole legal monopoly on violence. So the fewer voices you get, the larger monopoly you have upon a single ideology, especially when that ideology is focused upon the betterment and the encouragement of the nation rather than the nurturing and the freedoms of the individual all of which is enforced by the state's monopoly upon violence, well then, this is how you get the fascism portion of encroaching fascism. Now, let's get to the story so you can see what I'm talking about. Now, this story first popped up on the radar a few weeks back in the beginning of March when a bill popped up in a Senate committee hearing. That bill proposed making it a crime to insult or taunt the police. So imagine my surprise a few days later when it sailed through the committee and then their state Senate put it up to go for a general house vote. And in a matter of weeks behind closed doors and only a few people discussing it, this thing was a hair's breadth away from becoming a goddamn law. So people had to answer some questions and here's what it looked like. A co-sponsor of a controversial bill passed by Republicans in the Kentucky Senate that would make it a crime to insult police officers says the legislation is intended to help officers, quote, protect themselves from protesters. Republican State Senator Danny Carroll told Yahoo News that Senate Bill 221, which was passed back on March 12th on a 22 to 11 vote and is now headed to the Kentucky House, is meant to be a tool to protect the police at demonstrations like those that unfolded in the wake of the killing of 26 year old african-american breonna taylor back in march of 2020 quote this bill is not meant to stifle the emotion carol told yahoo news it's meant to protect the officers because in those situations when you've got someone that's right up in your face yelling in your face waving their arms calling you every name that you can think of they have no ability to protect themselves. That's right, State Senator Carroll would have you believe that these people, and these people, not to mention these people, and yes, even these people, they have no possible way to protect themselves from the hurts that the feels have when people yell insults at them. These people, the 
You know, the ones with the monopoly on state-sanctioned violence, and the assault rifles, and the body armors, and the 50 cals, and the smoke grenades, and the tear gas, and the pepper spray, and the tasers, and the less-than-lethal beanbag rounds, and all of the smoke pellets, and the lovely projectiles that they shoot into people's faces so that the less-than-lethal weapons are actually lethal. Yes, those people, they have no possible way to protect themselves from insults. Carol, a former police officer, says the disrespect he's witnessed firsthand is what led him to push for the bill's passage. Quote, there's a huge silent majority in this country that doesn't like the way our law enforcement are treated these days, he said. It seems that it's open season on law enforcement. Since when did that become okay in our country? I, I'm sorry, State Senator Carroll, when did it become okay to insult people and that not be a crime? When did it become okay in the United States of America to voice your displeasure or seek redress in public spaces from your elected officials? I don't know. I feel this might go back to one of those long form magical documents that was filled out almost 300 years ago by a bunch of white dudes who owned other human beings. Yeah, I think y'all seem to love that document when it comes to the first one and the second one. And I know there's some amendments after that second amendment, but pfft, Pish posh, screw the rest of those. Everybody gets to have guns and say what they want. Oh, that's right. Only they're not allowed to say it to the police officers because, again, police officers need to be protected from having their feelings hurt. SB 211 would make it a misdemeanor to challenge or taunt an officer with words or gestures that, quote, would have a direct tendency to provoke a violent response from the perspective of a reasonable and prudent person. A conviction would be punishable by up to 90 days in jail and a fine of up to $250. The bill also discourages local governments from defunding their police departments and would hold criminally responsible those who give protesters objects that can be used as weapons. Fun fact, I looked at the list of things that are weapons. Yeah, those large cardboard tubes that you put signs on, those are considered weapons. You know what's not considered a weapon? A hunting knife. Just saying, it's Kentucky. State Senator David Yates, a Democrat who voted against the bill, called it dangerous and told his fellow members on the Senate committee that he believed good cops had enough poise to not react to passionate rhetoric hurled at them by demonstrators. Quote, it makes my stomach turn because I don't believe any of my good officers are going to provoke a violent response because someone does a your mama joke or whatnot, Yates said to the committee. Yes, that's right. Right-wing conservatives, you know, the ones who are complaining about cancel culture. Oh my lord, they've gone off the deep end. They're trying to cancel insulting police officers. Oh, what's that? Oh, we want to have free speech and the right to bear arms? That's right, just not when the police are around. Because, you know, their feelings might get hurt. Last summer, following the police killings of unarmed black people, including Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, protests erupted all over the country. While some of the protests were marred by violent clashes with law enforcement and instances of vandalism resulting in the destruction of property, the overwhelming majority were peaceful. In fact, according to the Washington Post, 96.3% of Black Lives Matter demonstrations it analyzed involved no property damage or police injuries, and in 97.7% of these events, no injuries were reported among participants, bystanders, or the police. So again, a former cop deep in the state of Kentucky wants to make it a law that you cannot insult the police. You can't throw the police a finger. That's right, you can't flip them the bird, which, by the way, is also protected by the First Amendment. But again, we only care about those amendments when it refers to white conservatives. Nobody else is really allowed to have all those privileges, you know, like free speech or owning a gun or carrying a gun around in public. No, that's right. That's only for people who worship white Republican Jesus. For everybody else, it's just the boot heel of encroaching fascism. And then the next day, just like that, the bill vanished. Poof, gone until 2022. That seems kind of odd, considering that it passed the state Senate 22 to 11.
And while the people who sponsored the bill came out and said that they just needed to pull it back and do a little editing to, you know, make sure that they address the concerns of everybody who gave feedback on the bill, well, that's probably not exactly what happened. Uh, let me uh, take a little deeper dive here, and I'm going to show you the part of the turd that stinks the most. Although it was only a short session, this year's iteration of the Kentucky General Assembly was an unprecedented assault on transparency and the constitutional guarantees of free speech and freedom of the press. As counsel for the Kentucky Press Association, one of whom was a primary author of the state's Open Records Act, we saw firsthand how close Kentucky came to trading its status as a national leader in transparency for a new reputation as one of the state's most willing to trample on the First Amendment. It turns out out that state senate bill 221 making it illegal to insult the police was not the only bill that popped up within the realm of this same type of thing in the state of kentucky all at the same time further breakdown of sb 211 by the locals showed this the senate decided that the right response to this kind of protest is to jail citizens who hurt police officers feelings and to mandate that they be held for at least 48 hours with without bail. For the record, that's legally called kidnapping. The original version went even further. It would have stripped all public assistance benefits from anybody convicted of this offense and others related to protesting, a mean-spirited provision that trades on racial stereotypes and was rightly removed even from an otherwise unconstitutional bill. Another egregious example was the attempt to amend State Bill 48, a rather innocuous bill concerning the home addresses of police officers and other officials, which are confidential under current law. The Kentucky House tried to amend this bill at the 11th hour to add new criminal penalties and a private right of action against any person who disseminated information in print or online that could be used to identify a police officer, prosecutor, judge, or other named public employee or their family members. That means that any story about Governor Bashir, a former prosecutor, Attorney General Daniel Cameron, the LMPD officers involved in the Breonna Taylor case, and even the bill's sponsor would have been a crime if those officials claimed to have a reasonable fear of harm to themselves or their property. It's almost as if a specific ideological sect working within the government wants to ensure its own safety and its own prosperity by further installing the armed agents of the state, remember the ones who have the monopoly on state legal violence, by placing them further into your lives, further away from theirs, and using them as a cudgel to beat you and then ensure that you can't get out of jail, you can't make bail, and oh yeah, you can't get any kind of federal or government assistance again for the rest of your natural life. And now, let me give you a little context, a little history, put this all together, wrap it up with a bow, and then you can tell me what you think. Over the last 20 years, every time there's been a period of social upheaval, an organization will come forth from the background, usually with dark money or from behind a 5013C, somebody like the Heritage Foundation or ALEC, and they will write a whole bunch of very extreme bills and they will pass it along to representatives that they have on their payroll. And those individual people in those individual states will put up those individual bills, all of which are usually exactly the same. They just like scribble out the name of the state and write in, you know, their current state put that out, and they see what happens in short Senate sessions. How far does the bill go? What kind of support does it get? What angles are popular? And what can they use next year after the midterm elections? Because again, historically, midterm elections, the party that lost the White House, then comes back and trounces in the midterms. So all of these bills will have a far greater chance of getting pushed through after they get a little... <coughs> spit shine and a few more Republicans into state houses, even though most of these Republicans are usually only polling at about 30%. And that's where this coinciding with constant redistricting comes into play. 
What does it mean for you? It means just because there is now a Democrat in the White House again, and your state on some presidential map might have mystically flipped from red to blue, it means that a few thousand people in a couple of counties that aren't your county decided to come out and vote Democrat instead of staying home. So for the love of God, stop going to brunch on Sunday. Instead, Use your Sundays, start organizing, and keep your eye on the prize. Because all of that that I just read off to you that happened in Kentucky, chances are it's happening in your state too. You just don't know about it. Until next time, my name is James. I am from the internet and I am out. Peace.